Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Delightful, petite and charming Marie Blanchard was among the very few young beauties that ruled the entertainment scene in the 1950s with her stylish display of natural cuteness. She is recorded in history as one of the classic femme fatales of B-movies, but her glamorous lifestyle was tragically cut short in one of those live-fast-and-die-young reputations that left many of her admirers wishing it never happened for over a half-century ago. How did Marie Blanchard overcome paralysis to become a circus performer? A quick browse of her name online would turn up several beautiful photos of Marie Blanchard that would instantly remind you of her magnificent impact as a nature-made screen idol. Her brief stardom in the entertainment industry is attributable to her unique feminine elegance, though her life had obstacles, a life she lived battling one infirmity after another, from polio to appendicitis and later cancer, which invaded her life from childhood. As if fate was also jealous of her good looks, Marie had to battle her way through life as misfortunes tried to stop her from rising until she finally succumbed to the wishes of the unseen worlds. During her eventful years of career stardom, charming Marie Blanchard had all it takes to be who she wanted, coming from a privileged background with almost everything working in her favour, except destiny. She might not be one of the names you can easily remember while discussing famous Hollywood ladies, but she was sure among the most beautiful entertainers of typical mid-twentieth century shows, in print modelling and screen performance. Looking back at her life, I feel sad she never had enough time to entertain her fans with those lovely displays we often see in the newspapers, magazines, television and even movies. Her full name is Marie E. Blanchard, born in 1923 in Long Beach, California. Those who saw her early childhood attested that an epitome of beauty was given to humanity in her. The young beauty exhibited creativity and would dream of a dancing career. Her parent, an oil and mining billionaire father and a psychotherapist mother, Dr. Mary Sennett, was available to ensure their little daughter gets the best of the things in life. Passionately believing she could make it in dancing, Marie as a child was willing to follow her dream, but unfortunately at the age of nine, tragedy struck. Little Marie was diagnosed with acute poliomyelitis. For three good years she was bedridden with the illness, and by the time she fully recovered her health, little Marie felt that she might not be able to fulfil her dream of dancing for her fans, following the effect of the disease. It was a serious concern, so she decided to do something about it. She began crucial exercises to correct her once paralysed limbs. Reports say she had to swim daily for several years, and sooner she discovered a place that can help her grow further. Her delightful dream, as joins Cole Brother Circus, then she was still seventeen years old. With this entertainment platform, Marie rides elephants and equally performed on the trapeze. Even if she could not dance, as she initially intended, it would not prevent her from developing an entertainment career and possibly showing her beauty to the world. Marie aimed to get herself fully back to fitness, but her activities at the time did not go down well with her high-profile parents, especially her much-educated mother, who wanted her daughter to obtain a university degree. So they persuaded her to leave the circus, and she proceeded to Santa Barbara State College, UCLA, and later USC, where she studied international law. But the young beauty was not at home with her studies, as she had her eyes set on the entertainment industry. While still studying, Marie began modelling for a Los Angeles swimsuit firm, a job she thought was closer to her desire, as she found herself ending her academic with nine units less than the law degree requirement and it did not look like she was ready to follow a law-related career as she journeyed to New York to seek her kind of employment, and was soon united with the Conover Agency as an advertising model, while also being marketed by famous cartoonist and writer Al Cap. After Cap spotted her and was inspired to produce his Lil' Abner comic strip as a model, he named her character Lil' Abner. Appearing as a con of a girl, she showed on a stunning advert pose for a modern shoe shop and lived on a $50 an hour pay, doing what she loved, showing her beauty and selling brand ideas. 
I also learned that through CAP, Marie went on a nationwide publicity tour promoting Sadie Hawkins Day. At this time, her popularity was rising in geometrical progression. But it was not until she did a Kodak advert that saw her on the back page of The Hollywood Reporter that studio moguls picked up interest in her. Paramount Pictures quickly put Marie on their payroll, though her initial movie experience was nothing to write home about. The reason was that she was given mainly walk-ons or minor parts. Recall how in the Ten Tall Men film, for instance, she just had a brief scene that saw her loop a parasol, smiling seductively at men of the Foreign Legion, as her only role. What she did not get in Paramount, however, was waiting for her in Universal, career breakthrough, as Marie joined the studio and was paired with Victor Mature in The Vales of Baghdad. Later on, she told fans how grateful she was about working for Paramount, for the acting knowledge they impacted on her. I am grateful to the studio for training me, but each role that came was either very big or very small for me, adding that she would have gone back to her New York modelling if not for Bob Schwartz, her agent, who, she said, wouldn't let me get discouraged. Talking about her beauty, Marie said she figured that a girl has until 35 years to earn money with her face and figure. I wanted to use up those years left to me constructively, she declared. As she was glittering on screen, so were her off-screen romances. The media also had eyes on her. At a time, Marie was frolicking with Broadway attorney Bentley Ryan. Their romance was a kind of an open secret until a gossip columnist decided to scandalously expose the affair. A journalist identified as Walter Winchell had in his report alleged how a fresh femme lead had taken over Bentley Ryan's life, causing Ryan's wife, Marguerite Chapman, a serious heartbreak, and she quickly filed for a divorce. Marie's excruciating beauty made it impossible for her to remain in one relationship at a time, because, just as Ryan's scandal was trending, she was often spotted with Scott Brady. Expectedly, the scandalous reports grew in their number, but one got her so infuriated, the report suggested that she and Lewis Hayward are about to be married. The report tended to defame her image, and she was angry over it. While Marie was boiling over the information, she took time to explain to her fans that Bentley Ryan remains her choice of a man and no one else, adding that she has never met the said Haywood before. A few months after, her romance with movie lawyer Greg Boutzer was ignited. Somehow she was doing her shows and attracting more fame. A stakeholder had described Marie as the girl we'd most like to train our lens on, and in no time she was made Miss Click in 1953 by the Hollywood Cameraman's Guild. Perhaps she was advised to continue her education, but Marie would not trade her career fame with academics as she began evening classes, becoming a night student at UCLA. Friends and close pals thought her affair with Greg Boutzer would be cemented in matrimony, but Greg, who divorced his wife Buff Cobb earlier, could not pull through because Marie was just too distracted by her cuteness to be tied down in marriage. Not when she was confirmed to be the hottest movie breath, more passionate than legendary Hollywood beauties, according to Hollywood film sound expert Joe Lapis. Analyzing the love scene moment that she kissed Victor Mature in The Vales of Baghdad, Joe asserts that, in the stillness, she inhales and exhales the sexiest I've ever heard. Joe authoritatively places her top among those he described as Hollywood's sexiest breathers that include Hedy Lamar, Jane Russell, Lana Turner, Barbara Stanwyck, Marlena Dietrich, Greer Garson, Virginia Mayo, Kareen Calvet, and others. Her outings in that movie elevated her status in Universal as they built her on the same level as Shelley Winters and Tony Curtis. Although Marie was so charming, she was also a jealous lover, which was why she had to restrict Greg Bouncer from visiting her on the Son of Sinbad set, because she was afraid that beautiful girls around could steal him from her, and she would not want to lose her Prince Charming. Other things happened in that production. Marie refused to dance because she thought her costume was too revealing. The set is too much temptation, she later explained, of course to the men. It seems there was a healthy rivalry in the studio because Marie soon loses a juicy role in Saskatchewan to Shelley Winters. 
After parting hard with Greg Boutzer and becoming the US Pacific Fleet's Eye Girl, as published by the Fleet's magazine, Marie, appearing as I in Arizona, told friends that her affair with Greg was over, saying, though, Greg is a wonderful fellow, we'll have a talk when I get back. But that would not be because she was in love with him. A very versatile talent, Marie was in the entertainment scene, acting, modelling and winning top brand icons. Within this period, she was also declared Miss Classy Chassis by the United Auto Workers of the West. She was excited about a leading role in the A-grade Western Vera Cruz film in 1954 that she told the media she will wear only a smile in the movie's bathing scene, while the co-producer Burt Lancaster and leading man Gary Cooper look on. Unfortunately, Universal would not let her go to United Artists and banned her from doing the lucrative role. The role was later offered to Denise Darcel. When she was cast in the 1954 version of the film Destry, it inspired her to extremely change her look, including changing her hair colour to black, which gave her a strange appearance. Just so, she would not be recognised as the famous Marie that everyone knew. She was reprising a character Marlena Dietrich had played in its earlier version. Even a borrowed character name, Frenchie, which she'd used before, was taken out and replaced with Brandy, but the TV show proved difficult for her at some point. In one of the fighting scenes, Marie got injured on her face during the filming. That incident increased the enmity between Marie and director George Marshall, who also did the first edition of the show. Although the movie was a success, it became the end of the road for Marie, as Universal regrettably dropped her as her contract expired. Miss Blanchard's career subsequently went south in a swift decline. Observers say she gave herself an unrecognisable outlook with her hair changed to black. She became different from Marie Blanchard, everyone knew, and funnily fooled Agent Paul Small, who mistook her for fictitious Senorita La Plaza from Mexico City, as Greg made him believe. Critics think that she was not fairly treated because her relationship with director George Marshall was not the best for a star actress and her director on set, although she appeared in She-Devil, depicting a tuberculosis patient who turned into a murderer, life was no longer the same career-wise for Marie, as continued freelancing for smaller studios. At this time, things almost turned disastrous for her in one of her routine filmings due to her acute appendicitis. One remarkable role Marie did before she finally fizzled out was the cheerful and lovable town madam in the noisy western comedy McClintock, which starred John Wayne. That same 1963, Marie Blanchard got informed of her cancer disease, which ultimately would end her life when she was just 47. But before this time, Marie took time to enjoy her glamorous love life with her lovers. Although she was married three times, first to Reese Hale Taylor Jr. and later to George Shepard, none lasted up to a year. Her last marriage with photographer Vincent J. Conti in 1967 ended with her demise about three years after. But for her beaux, Marie was up and blazing, dating several men from different walks of life, including actor John Dennis. Marie and Dennis were often seen together in 1955, and sooner she met and began another affair with George Raft the same year. And when a gossip columnist mirrored in on her scandalous love life, Marie told fans that she did not have an affair with John Dennis, adding that she only worked with him in a picture but never went out socially with him. She criticised the reporter who she said erroneously linked her to him. Her connection with George Raft was not smooth either, with the particular issue at Ciro's club show, but when Marie fell in love with Mel Torm, it was a different ball game. Mel's wife, Candy Toxon, immediately initiated a divorce against her husband, as she had plans to wed Hal March, the $64,000 question star. Just like she did with Greg Boutzer, Marie got deeply connected with Mel Torm, but that one also ended just the way it had started. I hear that her name was in Johnny Stampanato's brown book that had names and telephone numbers of many famous Hollywood actresses like Anita Ekberg, June Allison, Zaza Gabor, Arlene Wellen, June Easton, Beverly Tyler and others. It was not until she was 32 years that she finally decided to take a marital vow for the first time, that marriage with the divorcee and father of four, Reese Hale Taylor Jr. in Las Vegas, 
was doomed. With the couple still on their honeymoon, Marie did not just discover that Reese was a womanizer. She got shocked by her husband's angry reaction when she informed him that she was pregnant. That was how the marriage ended as soon as possible, as she asked for an annulment. Even as the likes of Mel Torm were still interested in her, but Marie Blanchard had moved on with her life, especially as she left the movies and concentrated on making appearances on a few television shows until her deteriorating health became unbearable. At the time of her death from cancer in 1970 at the Motion Picture Country House and Hospital in Woodland Hills, Marie was survived by her third husband, Conti, who was still married to her. But now it's time to switch gears and explore the wild and unconventional life of Lupe Velez, Hollywood's most feared badass woman. In our next video, we'll take you on a journey through Lupe's rise to fame and her tragic end. Trust me, it's a captivating tale.